This is a video on ovarian pathology. We're going to be talking about neoplastic and non-neoplastic diseases of the ovaries, and we have quite a list of diseases to go through. These diseases can be broken down into categories. The first two at the top are non-neoplastic. The next three are epithelial neoplasms, neoplasms of the surface epithelium of the ovaries. Next four are sex cord stromal neoplasms. Next five are germ cell neoplasms. And the last two are malignancies that involve spread of cancer to or from the ovaries. Let's get started with polycystic ovary syndrome. This is a disease characterized by two of the following characteristics. We have reduced ovulation, hyperandrogenism, which is high testosterone and the downstream symptoms of that. We also have polycystic ovaries. Polycystic ovaries can be seen in this picture here. This is an ultrasound of the ovaries. We can see a cyst right there and a cystic space right there. And if you have more than one of these cysts, it's considered polycystic ovaries. I think even one cyst in the ovaries would meet this qualification actually. So you need to have at least two of the following to be diagnosed with this disease. Clinically, these patients present with hirsutism, which is male patterned hair growth. That usually means hair on the trunk, on the chest, and on the face, much like a male would have. You can also get acne, infertility, and often it's associated with obesity and diabetes mellitus 2, type 2. And uh, usually obesity and diabetes mellitus have something to do with the pathogenesis of PCOS. And that's something we'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> Labs here show high testosterone. You have an increased ratio of LH to FSH. Usually this ratio is greater than two. Uh, that usually means that you have a high LH and a low FSH. You also have high estrone here from the peripheral conversion of the excess testosterone. And my way of remembering these is all of these are kind of downstream effects of very, very high LH. If you have high LH, the fecal cells are going to make high androgens. So you have high testosterone. Those androgens can then be peripherally converted to estrogens, so you have high estrone, and those estrones and those testosterones then feedback inhibit the brain to produce less FSH. So you end up having low FSH as well. On ultrasound, as we discussed, you see bilateral non-ovulated enlarged cysts, like we see in that picture there. Cause here is thought to be hyperinsulinemia related. So high insulin decreases a binding globulin called SHBG, that steroid hormone binding globulin. This is a protein that binds testosterone. So if you have lower SHBG, you're going to have more androgen production and more effective androgen. Obesity also causes decreased SHBG. So that also increases the, affected, uh, the effective testosterone. And that leads to some of the clinical symptoms like acne and hirsutism. When diagnosing PCOS, you want to exclude congenital adrenal hyperplasia, exclude hypothyroidism, exclude hyperprolactinemia, and Cushing's disease. These patients are at increased risk of endometrial carcinoma, and this is because of the high estrogen levels. Treatment here depends on what you're looking to treat. To treat the hirsutism, you want to start with diet and exercise, start with lifestyle modifications. Uh, you can also try some, uh, some anti-androgens like flutamide, which is an androgen receptive competitive inhibitor. You can try finasteride, which is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, spironolactone, which inhibits steroid binding and the synthesis of testosterone. You could also use OCPs, which would lower the androgens through feedback inhibition. Uh, metformin might also help to treat the diabetes that's usually associated and the insulin sensitivity that uh, leads to the hyperinsulinemia that can cause this disease. If you want to treat the infertility associated with PCOS, you might try clomiphene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modifier that is an agonist in the brain. So uh, you might also combine that with letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor. So both of these would kind of decrease the number of estrogens in the body, decrease the estrogen levels. And the logic behind that is that if you have lower estrogens for a short amount of time, that's going to stimulate the body to make more endogenous LH and FSH, which can lead to ovulation and maybe treat the infertility. Next is a disease called endometriosis. This is when the endometrium, or the inner lining of the uterus, grows outside of the uterus. The endometrial glands and stroma is present in ectopic locations. This is most often found in the ovaries, and that's why it's discussed in this video. This occurs via four proposed mechanisms. Main mechanism is retrograde menstruation. When menstruation goes backwards up through the fallopian tubes and into the ovaries, that's backwards of how menstruation should usually go. 
Dissemination through the lymph or blood is another proposed mechanism. This could be, this could happen iatrogenically after a surgery. Some uh, endometrial glands and stroma can be dropped in other places of the body. There's also a kind of a wild theory of spontaneous endometriosis or metaplastic differentiation into endometrial glands and stroma. Histologically, you need two of the following to diagnose. You need to actually see the stroma. You need to actually see the glands and or you actually need to see the hemorrhage or hemosiderin laden macrophages, which is essentially the, the late hemorrhage, hemorrhage after it's been uh, swallowed up by macrophages. You need to see two of these three on histology to diagnose. Clinically, you uh, might present with ectopic pregnancy, with infertility, pain is pretty common. Uh, you also have pain with sex, urination, and menstruation, or just pelvic pain in general. And lastly, this can progress to endometrioid carcinoma and clear cell carcinoma. Next disease is cystadenoma. This is a tumor, a benign tumor that grossly presents as a cystic mass containing serous or watery fluid or mucinous fluid. This uh, fluid arises from the surface epithelial cells and it has a smooth external and internal lining in the cystadenoma. Histology shows a picture here where uh, you have single cells, a flat layer at the very top of that image. So the lumen of the cyst would be above that image and you have a flat lining of non-stratified serous or mucinous adenoma. The benign, this, is, this tumor is benign because it's usually just a single layer of cells that's defective. Clinically, these patients are usually in their 30s to 40s, so they're premenopausal. They present pretty late when they have abdominal fullness and pain. This is also related to a Brenner tumor, which is a similar looking tumor that looks like the bladder. It's urothelium-like, so it's yellow tan and pale in color. Next is the borderline tumor. Borderline tumor is kind of halfway between a cyst adenoma and a cyst adenocarcinoma. So this one is uh, kind of like a cyst adenoma of low malignant potential. So most of these are benign, but they do have some potential to be malignant. So they should be staged to make sure. This is also common in younger patients, premenopausal. Grossly, you see a cystic mass with internal nodules and excrescences. On histology, you see proliferative multiple layers, atypical epithelial lining. So that makes it look a little bit worse than the cystadenoma, where you only had one layer, it looked pretty benign. These look atypical, uh, although there is not yet any stromal invasion. So they're not yet cystadenocarcinomas, but they do have low malignant potential. Um, they're not completely benign. These are the malignant ones. Grossly look like thick, jagged uh, lining. They have internal papillary excrescences. So they can, these can also be classified as serous or mucinous, just like the cystadenocarcinomas or the cystadenomas. On histology, they are proliferative and you see malignant lining. These are actually invasive as opposed to the, cystadeno uh, the cystadenomas, which were just one single line. The serous variant has nuclear hobnailing, which is when the nucleus kind of pops out the side of the cell into the cavity. Uh, you can also see some bodies, which are dystrophic calcifications, bundles of calcium that were malformed. The mucinous variant has a gray purple mucin inside the cell cytoplasm, and that's pretty characteristic for that. Clinically, these patients are older than those of the cystadenomas. These are usually postmenopausal women in their 60s to 70s. They present late, and they usually present the same symptoms, abdominal, pelvic, pain, and fullness. Serum marker here is CA125, and these are used to guide treatment and the recurrence of cystadenocarcinoma. <clears throat> the serous variant of cystadenocarcinoma is the most common malignant ovarian neoplasm. There's usually a poor prognosis for this and it spreads locally to the peritoneum. There's a couple uh, genes that are associated with cystadenocarcinoma. BRCA1 is the best association. So you have an increased risk for the serous variant here. Uh, BRCA2 is also associated, and so is Lynch syndrome. There's a specific variant of cystadenocarcinoma that is called the endometrioid variant, which is usually malignant and can arise uh, from or is associated with endometriosis. On histology for the endometrioid var variant, you do not see nuclear hobnailing. Instead, you see cribiform growth pattern of columnar epithelial cells. You see smooth glandular luminal borders, and you see stratified and overlapping nuclei. So a bunch of nuclei that look bunched together and are overlapping. Next up is the granulosa cell tumor. Epidemiology here is that this happens to patients of all ages, but predominantly in women in their 50s, there's usually a late recurrence for granulosa cell tumors. These have low-grade malignancies. 
on gross pathology, they look solid and lobulated. Histology has pretty characteristic call exner bodies, which are granulosa cells around the eosinophilic fluid. So they look like a follicle and they're indicative of cellular degeneration. You might also see coffee bean nuclei here. That top histology image on the right there shows the call exner bodies that are worth knowing. Um, you can see how there's an eosinic fluid in the middle um, and there's these cells that are around the, uh, the fluid, the granulosa cells around that fluid. Clinically, you see symptoms of estrogen excess because granulosa cells usually produce estrogen. This includes precocious puberty, breast tenderness, postmenopausal bleeding, or AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding. You might also see high inhibin levels here too. Next up is thecal cell tumor, or theca cell tumor, or thecoma. Many names for this. Epidemiology here is that's pretty common. On histology, you see luteinized stromal cells. Clinically, this also has symptoms of estrogen excess. So again, that's the precocious puberty, breast tenderness, AUB, postmenopausal bleeding that produces extra, ex excess estrogen. Next up is the Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Sertoli cells form tubules, which are derived from the male sex cord cells. These tumors are known to be malignant, and the Leydig cells here contain Reinke crystals. They are rod-like inclusions that you see on histology. These can produce androgens, so you can get symptoms of high testosterone. That's hirsutism and virilization. They also produce estrogen sometimes, and you can get the same excess estrogen symptoms. Next is fibroma. Fibroma is a benign tuber of fibroblasts. Epidemiology here is that they're very common. They usually appear sporadically. Grossly, you can see that picture there on the left is the tumor, that left white mass. You have a solid white mass that's firm with white bands. On histology, you do see collagen. So it is, it's a tumor of fibroblasts, so it makes sense that you see collagen. You also see bland spindle cells. Two syndromes are associated with fibromas that are worth knowing. You have Meg's syndrome, which is associated with pleural effusion and ascites in addition to fibroma. There's also a Gorlin syndrome, which is associated with a gene mutation and inactivation of the PTCH gene, and you also get some fibromas. Next is teratoma. Lots to say about teratoma. When teratomas are benign, they're usually mature cystic teratomas. So mature teratomas are benign. The, the benign variant is also called a dermoid cyst. This is the most common germ cell tumor, and it's also derived from fetal tissue containing two or three embryologic layers. So two or three of the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Grossly, you see a cystic lesion. It's bilateral 10% of the time, and these can contain anything like teeth, hair, bone, thyroid, gut, all kinds of tissues that are found in teratomas. It's kind of gross looking. Histology shows squamous keratinizing epithelium, if you have skin, for instance, you might see hair follicles if there's hair grossly. So it really depends on what embryological layers you have there. Clinically, the patients present with pain from ovarian enlargement. And if there's no immature lesion, it's benign, as we said. If there is an immature teratoma, those are malignant or those can be malignant. Um, grossly, those look solid. On histology, you see primitive neuroepithelial rosettes. We'll see pictures of those in a second. And epidemiology here is commonly postmenopausal. There's also a specific type of teratoma called struma ovary, which produces thyroid tissue. It's composed of thyroid tissue, so often um, you might, not, not, not often, it's pretty uncommon to get hyperthyroidism associated with that, but it is possible, and that's struma ovary. So let's look at some histology of teratoma. At the top here, you see a mature cystic teratoma, so that one's benign. You can see three layers of embryological tissue. You can see mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. On the bottom there, you see the immature teratoma, and you see the characteristic neuroepithelial rosette. That's that round circle. Let's see if I can highlight it right here. Round circle of blue cells. That's a neuroepithelial rosette in a uh, immature teratoma that's more likely to be malignant. Next is the yolk sac tumor. These are also called endo endodermal sinus tumors. These are usually malignant. Uh, these are the most common germ cell tumors in kids. Grossly, they look like a primitive yolk sac with a solid mass and hemorrhagic necrosis. Histology here has characteristic Schiller-Duval bodies, and that's worth memorizing. They look like a glomerulus. Um, so on, on histology, it looks like you have a glomerulus, but you're not in the kidney, you're really in the ovaries. It's Schiller-Duval body. And clinically, the yolk sac tumors have increased serum AFP. That's a serum 
tumor marker that's worth knowing for yolk sac tumor. Next up is dysgerminoma. Epidemiology here is that this is the most common malignant germ cell tumor. On histology, you see large cells with central nuclei, often with large nucleoli. They also have clear cytoplasms containing glycogen, and you often see monotonous cells. So this, all the cells kind of look the same. They all kind of look like fried, fried eggs as well. So they're called fried egg cells. Clinically, you have two serum markers that relate to dysgerminoma. This is high LDH and high HCG. Treatment here is radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and there's a good prognosis. They're pretty sensitive to chemotherapy. Uh, good outcomes for dysgerminoma. There's an equivalent germ cell tumor in males known as seminoma. So seminoma in the testicles is should be associated with dysgerminoma in the ovaries. Next is choriocarcinoma. This is a tumor developed from the trophoblasts and synchiotrophoblasts, and there are no chorionic villi here. So it's from the placental tissue, but there are no chorionic villi. Choriocarcinomas are malignant. They spread hematogenously. This is worth knowing because it's one of four tumors that spread hematogenously, uh, specifically to the lungs in this case, and that produces some of the symptoms that you get. This image here shows the distribution of stage four choriocarcinoma, where it has spread to the liver and the lungs. Epidemiology here is that it can occur in the mother or the baby. It's a pretty rare tumor. Grossly, it looks small and hemorrhagic. It's a hematogenously spread tumor, so it kind of makes sense that it's hemorrhagic. Clinically, you see hemoptysis, and that makes sense if it has spread to the lungs. You see shortness of breath and increased HCG. These are not chemosensitive, unfortunately. They're rare, but not chemosensitive. Next is the embryonal tumor. These are malignant and aggressive cancers. They are hemorrhagic grossly. And on histology, you see large cells with an embryo-like morphology. As you can see in that picture on the right there, you see prominent nucleoli and the, nuclear, the nuclei are crowded and they overlap. Clinically, you see sexual precocity. You see abnormal uterine bleeding. Uh, you also have normal HCG and normal AFP level for a pure embryonal carcinoma. Uh, it's important to note that these often present as a mixture with other germ cell tumors. So if another germ cell tumor is causing a high HCG and high AFP, you'll see that. But a pure embryonal carcinoma usually has a normal HCG and normal AFP serum markers. Next up are the malignancies. We're going to talk about the Kruckenberg tumor, which is a cancer that has spread from the GI tract to the ovaries, usually from the stomach to the ovaries. These Kruckenberg tumors consist of mucin-filled signet ring cells. Uh, signet rings are those rings they usually they used to use to like stamp envelopes, um, and the the tumor cells look like that here because the nuclei is out toward the edge of the cell, kind of poking out of the cell. So that's what we see histologically as well, the signet ring cell morphology. On gross pathology, you see a glistening surface, and this is because these cells produce mucus that makes it glistening. Lastly, we have the pseudomyxoma peritonei. This is another malignancy, this time in the opposite direction. This malignant cancer spreads from the ovaries to the intraperitoneal organs, whereas the Kruckenberg came from the GI tract, usually the stomach, to the ovaries. This one comes from the ovaries to the intraperitoneal organs. It can produce abundant mucin and gelatinous ascites. It can produce so much mucin and so much ascites that it fills the abdominal cavities and obstructs digestion and organ function. Malignancies usually come from the mucinous adenocarcinoma variant in the ovaries, although it could also come from the appendiceal tumor as well. This has been a brief video on ovarian pathologies, and we talked about several diseases. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.